In the last video, we talked about the real life story of the glory drama from Netflix, where a student would try to get revenge on his taunting classmates 12 years later. And kind of continuing the same topic of true crime, it led me to discover another bizarre case of a student being obsessed with his high school teacher and would create his own bizarre fantasy stories with her, even dreaming of kidnapping and falling in love together. And for 15 years, he would dream of this deadly obsession until he sort of succeeded. I think we've all had like high school crushes before on our teachers. I think it's sort of a natural thing that everybody kind of goes through. It's kind of common and harmless and eventually it grows away as you get older. But what if that feeling never went away for someone? This is kind of like a Wattpad story gone wrong in real life. Today's story is also made into a movie called Abducted Mary Stoffer's Story. It's on Lifetime. Let me know if you guys have watched the movie version because it's a pretty great reenactment of the true story of what happens and there's a lot of scenes where I was like okay did that really happen or was that for the movie and I just want to say thank you to everyone from my last couple videos I was talking about how the algorithm was being pretty hard and you guys really engaged in the comments like the video and subscribed which helped to get those stories be seen and then make sure that these stories are not forgotten because I try to pick stories where not a lot of those major youtubers are talking about so again just one second to like and just engage in the comments and sharing the video really helps thank Thank you so much. In the 1960s to the 70s, Mary Stoffer was a high school math teacher in Minnesota and she was only 21 years old when she started teaching. That is incredibly young. This is a photo of her at that age and she was described to be a very caring, compassionate teacher. She also was very pretty and I feel like she emitted approachable teacher kind of energy. She kind of lived a normal life but as she went on and got older, she got married to a pastor named Irv. She would end up having two kids, one boy and a girl. The family were very devoted Christians and they actually would go to Philippines back and forth for a couple years to do some missionary work. So you see what kind of lifestyle Mary and her family had. They really devoted their life to help other people. They also lived in a quiet town in Minnesota and now it's 1980 where Mary and her entire family was to go back to the Philippines to spend another four years on their missionary trip. May 16th, 1980, now just four days before they were to fly out of the country, they were all packed, ready to move, and excited about their trip. Mary and her 80-year-old daughter, Beth, would decide to go to a salon to get a nice fresh haircut before moving. The two would leave the salon during daytime, and while walking to their car, an Asian man approached them at gunpoint and told Mary to not make any noise, otherwise he would kill them. And I looked up, I thought perhaps he wanted to ask directions. And he had a gun, pulled out the gun and put it at Beth's side and said, I need a ride. I remember thinking, this isn't really happening to me. What's going on? Is this a dream? I was very scared. So again, Mary's not alone. She has her eight-year-old daughter with her. And this man made both of them get into Mary's car and told her to start driving. And actually while driving, they came into an intersection and they saw a cop car. This man said, if you make any noise or wave to the cop, again, you and your daughter is going to be dead. Uh, you turn right. And if that police car turns the same way we do, you're dead. So being threatened and afraid, and unfortunately the cop didn't notice anything wrong and they lost their chance to get help. Along the ride, the man would tell Mary to stop and get into their trunk. He would duct tape their mouth and tie their hands and he now started to take control of the car. We were lying face down and then the trunk was closed. While in the trunk, Mary would bang and scream inside just to try and get anyone's attention. And unfortunately, it only got the attention of the kidnapper. So he stopped at some kind of a park. He checked the trunk and saw that the eight-year-old girl was freed. And Mary was obviously hysterical. And during that interaction, two young boys would come and see what was happening. They were both riding bikes around the park. They noticed this. They approached the car. And one of the boy named Jason, who was only six years old, was near the trunk of the car and he saw what was happening. He saw that there were two people being tied and stuffed inside the trunk and all he said was, whoa, 
And the man, the kidnapper, would grab Jason because he knew that now he had a witness and would stuff him inside the trunk along with the two people. The other friend was able to get away and alerted the police, but unfortunately it was too late. And it's really sad, but inside the trunk, these three people were just tightly squeezed and the boy was crying. He was scared. He didn't know what was happening. He was only six years old. So I started to talk. I said, my name is Mary and I'm 36 years old. And our daughter Beth is here and she's eight years old. And we don't know who this man is. And we don't know what he wants. And we don't know what he's gonna do to us. I think he said, I'm supposed to visit my grandpa and grandma tomorrow. And we just talked about being scared. Along the way, the car would stop again. The man got out, opened the trunk, and took only the boy. Mary says that then it went quiet and it seemed like they waited for a very long time. And the man came back and Jason was nowhere to be seen. Jason would be reported missing by his friends and family and he would disappear from that day on. The second friend was able to get a description of the car and they found out that this was the car that Mary was driving. So they knew that Jason and Mary being missing had to be done by the same person. And we'll come back to what happened to Jason in a bit. The car was stopped for the last time and they would switch cars into the man's van that he already parked and had ready. Eventually, he led them to their house and this is when the crazy story begins. This dude had it all prepared. As they got there, Mary and Beth would be locked together. There was some kind of a wire lock thing that he made personally so that Mary and Beth would always be locked up together. And he first stuffed them into his little tiny closet, which was only 21 inches by four feet. And here's a photo of what the closet looked like. And for most of the duration of when they were kidnapped, this is where they would be spending their time. There was a light bulb with a pole chain. There was a scatter rug on the floor and two small throw pillows. They took a screwdriver and removed the doorknob from the inside of the door and we were locked into that closet. Our hands were still tied. We could not reach up and turn on the light. And so the only thing we could do is lie down on that floor and we just had to try to get some rest because we didn't know what the next day would bring. They couldn't use the bathroom, a shower, or do anything without the permission of this guy. Mary also asked what happened to the boy, Jason, and the man said he just let him go. This is the crazy part where when I was watching the movie, I was like, there's no way this guy really did this. So he would bring Mary out and leave Beth, their daughter, inside the tiny closet locked up. He brought Mary to his own room and would tie her to his couch. But in this room, he had like camera set up and ready to record everything. And he started to interview her or quiz her. Like, it's some kind of a YouTube video making in the 1980s. Question started off with the man saying, do you know who I am? Mary obviously said, no, I don't know who you are. And the man got actually angry that Mary didn't recognize her. He finally disclosed that he was one of Mary's student 15 years ago in the ninth grade. The man was named Ming Shen Shui. He was now 29 years old, but back then he was just around 14 years old, again, a student of her math class. Ming was born on October 15th, 1950, immigrated with his family from Taiwan when he was just eight years old, ironically the same age as Beth right now. His father passed away soon after they moved, only three years later. He was also a professor himself at a university of Minnesota. I don't know, I thought that was kind of interesting, ironic, that his own father was a teacher as well, and he would be doing this to another teacher. So Mary had hundreds of students by now. She didn't really remember Ming. And Mary would say that she vaguely remembers Ming being a bright, wise looking student. I mean, nothing particularly stood out. And Ming at first said it was his form of revenge. Apparently 15 years ago, Mary gave him a B on the math class and he claimed that because of this, he couldn't go to college, he lost his scholarship and he was forced to serve in the Vietnam War and his life was all ruined because Mary gave him a B. I mean, Ming was actually in the school football team. He was also in the wrestling and he was even voted as most likely to succeed by his classmates. But in actuality, Ming was a dark, troubled 
angry kid. Ming's mother would recall him being very mean and violent to his siblings. When he was a teenager, he would go out and throw rocks at strangers' cars. He would even start a fire at random person's apartment. He would fight with his mother intensively. He would lie about everything and he did not have any remorse or understood consequences of his actions. It was beyond the teenage boy phase and his mother would say, quote, Ming had no feelings like a dog. I mean, at this point, I think animals are way better than humans, but I think what she meant, Ming was like a wild animal that she could not control or understand. And this is when his obsession with Mary would start at age 14. He would write in his diary or make a book with some crazy disturbing fantasy stories, kind of like a Wattpad 70s and 80s version. He wrote about him as the main character and a famous celebrity that he liked and they would have this like romantic storyline going in his fantasy story. The stories also got very dark, including R slash S assault. Very dark adult themed stuff that he would write about. Here's an actual list that was made by Ming and these are all famous celebrities that he had a crush on and that he obsessed over and that he wrote about. And one of the names in the middle is actually Mary Stauffer, his teacher. According to the police who read the stories, a lot of it was like him being the main character and the famous celebrities begging him for inappropriate adult stuff. And it was kind of like him liking being like a dominant king. So his story of getting revenge because she gave him a B was kind of a lie. Him serving in Vietnam War was a lie. Him not getting to college was a lie. He went to college, he did not go to Vietnam War. And he decided to kidnap her because his fantasies were not fulfilling him anymore. He wanted to now act upon it in real life. Ming would actually stalk Mary for the whole 15 years. It got really bad five years before the kidnapping and he found out an address that Mary was potentially living in. He broke into that apartment and realized that actually Mary did not live there. It was actually Mary's parents. Now during that time, Mary and the family was in the Philippines during their missionary work. So after Mary came back and he was still searching for her for another five years. Finally, when Mary came back from the Philippines after a couple years with her family, Ming found her and decided to stalk her house with a binocular. He knew what kind of room setup that her daughter had. He knew what Mary's husband looked like, her son. He knew that we were leaving because he saw these two great big crates in our living room. He eventually somehow found out that Mary was now moving to the Philippines once again and decided to kidnap her before she was able to move. Ming being now 29 years old, he was actually an owner of an electronic shop. The fact that he runs his own store, he's a boss, he had employees, he's not a stupid like crazy cuckoo person. Like this guy seemed very normal in the normal life and at night after work, he would go and stalk in a obsessed over these list of people that he made. Everything was being interviewed and finally Mary asked him, what is your plan with me? And this is when Ming on camera started to take off her clothing. She was R.S. assaulted and he filmed all of this. According to the evidence of the tapes, he would do this daily, hours sometimes, and threaten that if she didn't comply with him, he'd kill all of his family. And of course, she never knew what he would do with her daughter. In one of the tapes, he would get mad at Mary for not making love to him properly and kissing him like she did to her husband and he would try to suffocate her until she'd kiss him the way he wanted to. What kind of freaking sicko is that? As days and some weeks passed, it seemed like Mary and Beth kind of gained trust of Ming. Like he would allow them to be outside of the closet as long as he was in the house. But whenever he would go to work, he would lock them up in that small closet. Sometimes he would even separate them, having Mary stay in the closet while the daughter was locked up in the RV. And he would only allow them to shower once a week. And eventually, Ming would even allow Beth to call her father on Father's Day. And here's a tape recording that FBI recorded. Hello, Earth speaking. Hello, Dad. Yes, Bethy. Are you okay? Yeah. Is Mommy okay? Yes. That's good. Oh, I'm... Daddy, yes. Happy Father's Day. Oh, thank you so much, sweetie. You're fine, Dad. Oh, I'm so glad. We can't talk anymore. Um, when can you come home? I don't know. Can I talk... Can you okay, Dad? Can I talk to him? No. 
Okay, you call again. Okay. Bye. Bye bye, sweetie. According to the professionals, what Ming wanted was like a family. He wanted Mary to fall in love with her like a girlfriend or wife, someone that he can do anything he wanted with. And Ming wanted to play house, like sick fantasy house with his captors. He had found the person he wanted all these years and he had her in his control. And he believed that it was simply a matter of time that if she were with him long enough, she would come to love him. Day 23 of being kidnapped, Ming told them that he was going to take a family trip in his RV and he would take Mary and Beth to some kind of a store, like a mall. Beth was actually locked inside of the RV still and Mary went with Ming to go shopping. Ming had his gun with him and again threatened them that if Mary tried to run or get any help, he would kill her on the spot and everyone around them. So obviously they were continuously being threatened and scared of doing anything. So once in public, actually Mary used a cashier's check that she had to pay for something in hopes that FBI or police would be alerted if Mary was to use her check. But for whatever reason, I guess this was in the 80s, so the police was not alerted that she was using money. Beth being locked inside of the RV got the window to open and there were some teenagers outside and she told them, I'm kidnapped, please call help. And apparently these teenagers was like, shut up, you're joking and walked away. Like WTF, right? And now it was day 50 of being kidnapped, almost two months. Ming would agree that they would go to watch fireworks because it was Mary's tradition that she did that every year. And he would always use Beth as a control tactic so that Mary did not do anything. And they actually did go watch fireworks, but again, Ming was next to them 24 seven, so they could not actually get help. The next day, Ming would tell Mary that they're going to move and take them somewhere far. This is when Mary knew that Ming had no plans to release them and she truly thought that Ming would kill them at the end after he had his fun. Now day 53 of captivity on July 7th, Ming went to work as usual and both were changed together inside the closet. It seems like their wire was somehow tied to the hinges of that big nail from all the doors that you see and she noticed that that nail must be loose. And Beth was really scared. Her daughter would tell her mother, no, no, no. What if Ming comes back? He's going to kill all of us. Mary said that that was the moment that she, you know, gained faith from God. And she pulled that little nail out and it actually came off. They ran to the phone and Mary ended up calling the police. And she told them that she's Mary Stoffer. She's been kidnapped for a while now. I believe that they eventually found out 50 days being there of the house address. They decided to wait outside while the police came within minutes and they were finally rescued rescued after 53 days. And here's a photo of what they look like the day that they were rescued. As you see, they were tied together like this most of the time. Surprisingly, thank God, Beth, the little girl, looked okay. It seemed like Ming did not hurt her physically, at least up till then. Who knows what could have happened if they were there any longer. When they were at the police station, police asked them where Jason, the little six-year-old boy, was. But finding out from the police that Jason did not come home even even two months later, they feared for the worst that Jason was killed by Ming that day that they were kidnapped. And unfortunately, this was true. We find out that the day that they were kidnapped, Ming actually killed Jason with a metal rod fearing that he was a witness. Ming was at work when he was arrested and put into prison. And while awaiting trial, apparently he asked his inmate to kill Mary for $50,000. This is how obsessed this guy was. But thank God the inmate went to the police with this information and it was added to more evidence. Finally, there was a trial for Mary and Beth abduction and another trial for Jason's murder. During the trial for Jason, Mary stood as a witness and had to see Ming all over again. While Mary was testifying, Ming was somehow able to get away and run to Mary with this knife that he snuck in and ended up cutting Mary's lips, kind of like at the Joker sign. He also threatened her on the spot that if he came out of prison, he would kill her. And if she would be dead by that time, he would come after her kids. First of all, how did he sneak a knife in? Like, hello? And second of all, why? where are the guards? Like, why would you, how do you? Ming was finally sentenced to 30 years for the kidnapping and another 40 years for the murder of Jason. But because of some whatever, you know, crazy laws that I don't understand about parole system, Ming was eligible for parole 
meaning leaving prison in 2010, but was denied. And during the parole hearing, Mary being the bad she was, she decided to go to the parole hearing 30 years later and face Ming again. During this parole hearing, apparently Ming apologized to her, but obviously during parole hearings, because you want to get out, you have to apologize. Otherwise, the judge is not going to gain sympathy. But thank God the parole was denied and he will remain in prison as the court ruled that he still is dangerous to society. During the prison times, he actually went through a psychological evaluation and apparently they ruled that he was not mentally ill, but they did state that he has some kind of a psychological, like a distortion when it comes to adult sexual fantasies. This is Mary and Beth today and they both are survivors. They are so strong. Mary also does not have a grudge against Ming. She wants him to get the help that he needs. The fact that she decided to still face him 30 years after that and not have any grudge against him and just wish him the help that he needs. Just so much respect for Mary and Beth. Apparently in the American prison system, at least where Ming is, he there is no like help or classes to teach them about having the wrong distorted view when it comes to sexual or any other kind of views in life. I think in Korea recently, I've heard that there are classes for these kind of crimes, like people who are arrested for sexual crimes. There's a rehabilitation class, especially for those inmates. So you never know what kind of people are around us at work, at school, who might have grudges against us for literally the stupidest reason on the planet. Remember, your like in this video means so much and see you guys in my next video.